Thank you, and I uh, want to thank everybody uh, for, for coming. This is, uh, we've, we've been delighted at the enthusiasm and the uh, turnout for the boot camps and other related uh, biomedical informatics data related uh, activities. And so, so in this particular boot camp, um, we were inspired to um, uh, invite Adam, and, and he was kind enough to accept our invitation. Uh, really, the immediate impetus was a trip that Mary and I took to Washington University, and we were incredibly impressed by the sophistication and maturity of their uh, um, clinical data warehouse uh, effort, which, uh, which Adam, Adam leads. And uh, we've been viewing it really as a prototype for uh, after you know, some period of uh, uh, maturation, uh, what we'll be able to uh, accomplish here. And so we were delighted that Adam uh, was uh, willing to uh, come in, uh, and, and talk to us. So we're really looking forward to it. Uh, a Adam is uh, a Columbia Biomedical Informatics uh, PhD in Columbia is sort of the font, in some sense, of biomedical uh, informatics. Um, of course, you know we're su quickly surpassing them, but uh, <laughs> but but back back in the year 2000, uh, when when uh, when Adam graduated, uh, it was absolutely the place, and um, and in fact, uh, um, I got to know uh, Adam and and uh, his uh, uh, his his colleague and fellow student and fellow professor. Uh, uh, Philip Payne, uh, you know, roughly, roughly around around then. Gradually, it's a small community, and so Adam has a uh, remarkable history uh, in the, uh, the the sort of combination of academic uh, biomedical informatics uh, research, and he's a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, and uh, exceedingly practical enterprise level. Uh, data analytics and data management, where he targets both uh, the enterprise, uh, which is something that he's doing at uh, WashU, uh, as well as uh, research uh, applications. Um, and he has a long history of this. He uh, came from uh, the University of Washington to WashU, uh, something that no doubt causes people uh, who are not, a, not familiar with either of them a lot of confusion. Uh, and he had a uh, um, leadership role, or the leadership role in data uh, analytics and in biomedical informatics uh, there. Um, and uh, prior to that, uh, he was head of clinical biomedical informatics uh, um, at, at Intermountain Health, which uh, is an even more traditional uh, place uh, where uh, clinical informatics was uh, developed. And prior to that, he was professor at uh, Columbia. So I can see that I've used my five minutes. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome, welcome uh, Adam. Thank you, Joel, so much for that introduction, and Mary for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, I, this is, I think, my third time I've been at Stony Brook, but this is the first time since my nephew graduated from here, so I was able to kind of talk to him, uh, talking to him last night, saying, oh, I'm going out, out to your stomping grounds, and uh, you mean you're going to Strong Island? So I was kind of excited to get here. Um, I'm going to figure out how this works correctly. Um, let me start with... So when the European settlers first arrived to this area, uh, which we now call Long Island, or Strong Island as my nephew calls it, um, the, 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 peop the uh, Setauket people uh, were in the area that we, around Stony Brook from here to about the Wading River. And their, uh, one of their primary sources of food was the game that was in the forests that was pretty plentiful at that time, including white-tailed deer and wild turkey, but probably more than anything, it was the fish in Long Island Sound, such as the herring or the Atlantic striped bass. Um, they also uh, gathered a bunch, uh, hickory nuts, and, and probably more commonly, the clams uh, in the area. In fact, uh, the Wading River, which, uh, which represents kind of the um, easternmost extent of the uh, Setauket uh, tribe, 
was uh, based on an, a word that kind of means the, the where we go to wade in the water to get um, uh, to get round clams. And so, so they kind of were familiar with that. They also uh, planted corn where they would uh, in each uh, mound or each hill where they planted it. They would put uh, as commonly you know as uh, many of us as kids we heard the story about. Um, Squanto and the help for the pilgrims, uh, where they would put a herring in that as fertilizer and use that. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, did this guy get the wrong slides, or this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty extensive land acknowledgement that he's doing as he starts out this. Um, actually, that's not my intent directly on this. What I'm trying to do, I've, I've walked you through here from hunting to gathering to farming. And that's going to be really important because in terms of the data and real world data that we use in healthcare, that's a really significant transition that we need to recognize that we make. In 1655 was the first, um, the first land sale in this area when, uh, with the Setauket tribe where, where they uh, gave up a lot of the land which was to the European settlers who immediately moved to farming. And so what we know in healthcare, we've had when um, Joel was reflecting a lot on the time where I was at Columbia and early on in my career. And at that time, if you wanted data to do something interesting, you were hunting. You had to figure out how to get that data. If you wanted to do something with it, you you've got to go all the way down to figure out who's going to collect it, how you're going to use it. And since then, we've had this broad implementation of electronic health records, heavily funded by all of you through the government, um, you the people. And uh, before then, it was just funded by you, the patients. Uh, but it, was, uh, it, it has led to where some estimates about 10% of healthcare institutions had electronic health records, and now 99%. So it's kind of rare to find one who hasn't. I think you have to go somewhere in where it's really remote to, to find someone that doesn't have uh, electronic health records. Um, so now, if you want to do research with the real world data, <clears throat> uh, it's actually pretty easy to find a project to do. We're in the, this gathering stage. You can just go and pick it out. It's just plentiful, like hickory nuts growing all over uh, or clams in the water. The problem there is that gathering societies are actually not really sustained. They're usually, in times of scarcity, pushed out by hunters or they're pushed out in times of plenty uh, by farmers, as we kind of saw with the, the history of Long Island and that purchase in 1655. So, our goal in this field should therefore be to get past this stage that we're in now, where it's just become too easy to work with the data and, and too, too convenient, but what we really need to be doing is applying some methods to use it more correctly, really getting to farming. And that's what I'd like to talk in that kind of context as I talk about using real, real world data. Everything is in the, well, we've got a lot of data. Are we gathering or are we farming? And there's some pretty specific examples of what we need to do to do this correctly because there's, you know, it's, there's reasons why gathering isn't sustainable. It, it, it doesn't maximize what we have in front of us in the same way that farming does. So, I'm going to start with, I'm going to basically through this answer three primary questions. The first of which about real world data is how we use it. And then I'm going to also talk about how we share it because that becomes important and really glad that Trinetics is here to help with that because there's a significant contributor in that space. And then finally, how we understand it. With then, of course, at the end, because you have to do this now, some comments about ChatGPT. So, uh, so. Uh, as I was uh, calling my sister and telling her I was coming to kind of her stomping ground, she lives in Connecticut, Connecticut was in Westchester when I was at Columbia, uh, hung out a lot with her, um, saying, I'm coming to your stomping grounds. Once again, she phrased it incorrectly, oh, you're talking about infomatics and uh, informatics. And so even then, and it, like with my mother, like so many times, what are you, now what is it that you're really doing? And so this was a big deal in the 2004 presidential debates when the topic of what I do actually came up in these debates with uh, President Bush and John Kerry, where President Bush was talking about if we can bring technology to this healthcare field, what can we do? And I was like really excited and pointing that out. This was the same year that the Office of the National Coordinator had been created, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, and so it was kind of like reveling in this, wow, like not only can I ex expl are we relevant, but I can actually point to the people who have been wondering what I'm doing and say this is what I'm doing. So I'm kind of going to go through a little like walk through presidential debates in relation to electronic health records. So then in 2008, 
uh, both, so now it's both sides are talking about this. So we've got uh, Senator Obama and Senator McCain both talking about how we can use electronic health records and they, th how we can use them to reduce errors um, and reduce costs and the benefits. And there's pretty, like of all of the things that were talked about there, this is one of the rare points where there's pretty consistent agreement. So then came uh, with the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, uh, meaningful use and legislation that led to the implementation of the electronic health records. Um, and then, so we haven't really talked about it as much. I mean, if medical records in the last couple of presidential debates came up, it was usually about, uh, are, is this person really fit for office with the, you know, their health and what do the medical records say and trying to access it that way. So it's been a different kind of topic. But the, the, the conversation beforehand really led to this investment. And so where are we now? So last month, or maybe it was early this month, but just a few weeks ago, in the uh, presidential, the primary for the Republican Party, this is what was said by Governor Burgum, who is the governor of North Dakota. And so we talk about why we have the most expensive health care in the world. It's because the federal government got involved the same way, you know, and then they said we're going to subsidize a particular kind of software. Have you been to a doctor's office when the doctor's got his back to you and their hands on a keyboard? The only industry in the world that's ever absorbed one trillion dollars of IT and became less productive, saw less patients per day, is US healthcare because they were subsidizing certain kind of software. So kind of went from hero to zero relatively quickly there. Um, but I like this is an important kind of understanding of the environment that we're in right now. So um, somehow, we kind of got it wrong. We weren't as correct as we thought we were. There were a lot, you know, in 2003, there were a lot of estimates about health information exchange and what that was going to save, which, you know, led to the office of the uh, National Coordinator for Health IT, meaningful use in these electronic health records, everything that was going to be done and what it was going to do. And somehow we kind of missed it, right? We're, so we're here, but we still are in this place where we have lots of data. And so it behooves all of us to figure out well, what do we do now? Because I've talked to people about this quote, and they, well, what are you going to do? Rip it out? No, we're not going to do that. I mean, that kind of makes it worse, but where are we and what we need to do? So kind of eyes wide open on that. So to, for that, I'm kind of going like, where can we go to the 2012 um, debate between President Obama and Governor Romney um, about... Uh, places that have done this well in the alignment and where they've used data correctly. And they both, and this is another point where they had agreement, which was uh, places where they're doing this well, and they referred specifically to Intermountain Healthcare. Um, that I had, it was interesting, they said this during the time that I wasn't there, but I was there before it and I was there right after it. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about, because I think it kind of elucidates how you use real world data correctly and effectively through a story about Intermountain Healthcare. So in 2009, this was the cover of the New York Times Magazine with Dr. Brent James, who is kind of associated with um, the quality improvement activities that have been done at Intermountain Healthcare. And I worked with him closely when I was there, kind of a phenomenal individual and visionary. Uh, and then he would, uh, also he would train people throughout the country in kind of what makes, uh, what, how you do what they've been doing at Intermountain Healthcare. Well, what really is that? What have they really done? Uh, Jeff Anderson is a cardiologist that I also worked with, um, and around the time that I had returned to Intermountain, they published this study, which was the Factor 64 randomized clinical trial. They were going in and looking at people with high risk for cardiac events um, and trying to see can you screen them uh, using CT angiography. So in other words, they, you know, these are people that may be high risk. They may have... Uh, um, Occlusions in their, cardi uh, in their coronary arteries, if you can uh, look at that and intervene quickly enough, get stents in there before they're going to have a heart attack, it can really benefit them. But like many things in healthcare, these interventions that can screen and really make a difference are actually pretty expensive to do, so you can't do it for everyone. How do you do it to the right population? Let's get the people who are at high risk to find them by diabetes. That's relatively easy to do. Let's see how they do it. And so that's, that's what they were planning to do, and this was a seven-year study. If you, you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves as they're looking at this, and, and their years of follow-up is actually a little more than seven years, but here's a follow-up on what they did. Those of you who stare at Kaplan-Meier curves a lot, uh, you'll look at this and say, hmm, that doesn't seem to be much of an impact. And in fact, it wasn't. It was a negative result that they had found, and yet published in one of the top medical journals 
in the country. And so why was this so groundbreaking that they found something that effectively didn't work? Well, it was mainly because of what it showed about the population and what they had been doing. So the, the commentary about this publication said basically, what we're seeing here, with, it was the reaction to what was the published information. It was like, okay, great, so we found it didn't work, but this is your diabetes, your high-risk diabetes population. This is the best management in terms of hemoglobin A1C and LDL and other va uh, values that we've ever seen on what someone would call a high-risk diabetes population. What have you been doing? to do that. And so this statement is that they've, they've published a new standard for what's possible. And in fact, when you manage the risk of this primary care issue that well, suddenly these people that you thought were high risk are no longer high risk. And the expensive interventions that we're talking about don't make a difference anymore. That that's actually more, ex more effective than what these other things that we could have done for it. So this was kind of a fascinating study that they did and the, and the reaction to it. So, um, it, previous to that, when I was at Intermountain Healthcare, one of the interventions that I had developed as part of a grant and with other uh, people was the patient worksheet. So my favorite intervention in all of health information technology was a piece of paper uh, that you'd hand, that you know, they'd print out beforehand, give it to the doctor, they would use it as part of their uh, meeting with the patients, review things. You've got the it's kind of summary of the uh, of the cis, the you know the clinical conditions, what medications they're on, what the recent labs were, but then also at the bottom, just kind of and based on these results that you're seeing above, this is this is what we recommend that you be doing for these patients. Um, kind of a pretty effective one. Really worked well when we had unstable systems. If the system was down, people learned pretty quickly. If you had printed this out the night before, you could still function pretty easily. And I'd rather be lucky than good, um, but that kind of helped us in our implementation, as it turns out. Um, and then years later, after that Factor 64 trial, when they were trying to see what really made a difference, they had asked the clinicians these questions. Now, clear, to be clear, the patient worksheet was not the only intervention that they had done. Uh, in terms of managing diabetes. They also would provide lists to, do to doctors. This is your list of patients on your panel that are out of range for their hemoglobin A1C measures, which is a blood uh, sugar uh, measurement, or this is, you know, these people need to get fo uh, follow up something, you've got to reach out to them. So the things that the doctors can do directly, they had the patient worksheets as I showed, they had comparative outcomes where they pr would provide reports. Here's how well you are doing relative to your peers around you in terms of managing your po population with diabetes. Here's how you're doing uh, with people throughout the institution. So that gave some uh, awareness of what was possible, which turns out to be really important. Uh, Doctors are in a lot of, uh, under a lot of pressure to do a lot of things, but knowing what's possible can be really helpful to do that. And there was uh, a financial bonus at the end of a few thousand dollars. It wasn't like Wall Street bonuses that they were getting here for doing this, but some bonus for if they had breached some threshold that they got paid a certain amount extra every year. And for primary care physicians, that turns out a few thousand dollars turns out to be a pretty good um, in, uh, influencer. And th so they asked the organization, they asked the doctors throughout the organization, okay, looking at this, what made the biggest difference? Now, if I was in a classroom, I'd ask for people and raise their hands, and usually people raise their hands and say, oh, financial incentives, because we think that that's the big motivator for all of us, and, and in many ways it is, and I say, I just showed you the patient worksheet, like I was just here. <laughs> Which do you think it is? So it was the patient worksheet that they all said made the biggest difference, and there are reasons why, because it, like, in terms of decision support, it was where they needed to make the decision, it was fit very well within the workflow, it was easily used and stuff like that. And so this is an example of something that makes a difference and when we and actually transforms care and it was things like this that the government was looking at when they said we need to invest in health IT because organizations that are doing really good things are using data in this way so that was kind of the goal of what they did did we get there no somewhere along the line we lost this how to actually make it work to just getting the data out there and we just kind of got stuck in this gathering stage whereas that one is I think a really good place of where Intermountain Healthcare was basically farming. They'd learned how to use it effectively, um, plant the right crops, and, and yield the right, uh, the right results. So how do we use it? That becomes really important. How do we share it? As it turns out, it's really, really hard to get access to healthcare data. Prior to COVID, I was having a conversation with some people in Seattle, where I was at the time when I was Chief Analytics Officer for UW Medicine, about what are the kind of the challenges that we're facing. And I said, it's been almost 
20 years since HIPAA and 10 years since it became penalized through the High Tech Act of 2009. Um, and we're sitting here with a decade of experience where even still the only people who have access to healthcare data are the people within the systems. And I do not believe that that is sustainable. I don't believe the smartest people in the world are the people that like me, that are just working with these things. Um, I, I can think I'm smart, but I don't think I'm the smartest one in the world, and I don't think that creates all of the knowledge. And so it's been a very limited area of being able to do research with that, and that has caused problems because of the penalties and the disincentives for actually sharing information. That becomes a problem that we've got to figure out a way around. So one place that we kind of faced right against this, um, I mentioned I was at the University of Washington right before COVID, I was there during COVID. And I will claim that it was the first observed outbreak for COVID. Um, those of you who were in New York City at the time would argue that that was really the first outbreak. It wasn't just identified as quickly as they did in Seattle because the outcomes there were so so, uh, so much worse that it had to have been uh, you know circulating around in New York earlier. But this is an article in The Verge that was uh, reviewing kind of what led to the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, which was in many ways inspired by a comment that I had made to a senior group of people in informatics saying, we right now here in Seattle have more tests in one day than the rest of the country has combined in a year because we're dealing with this, we have the tests and what we're doing. Everyone wants to know what's going on. We are so busy with doing this, we can't do it. I wish we could share these data. I wish there was some way that we could get this data out so other people could use it and what's the right way to do this or could we combine it? And that led to um, really great work by the National um, Center for Advancement of Translational Science or NCATS and some people there and Melissa Handel and uh, Chris Shute, among other people who had kind of re-steered a large grant that they were working around, how can we share data with lots of different people. And uh, the Salts were heavily involved in kind of the publication aspects and other reviews of data. And I believe Stony Brook was also a participant in this, lots of organizations throughout the country, where they gathered the data together and said, well, we can pool this data together and, and make it accessible to other people. And one of the ways that they were going to make this accessible to other people was there, there was this opportunity to create synthetic data around it and see if people could analyze it. And that led to a collaboration that I had with Philip Payne, which led to where I am now. So um, uh, as another bit of background on this, this is a paper uh, we published around that same time in 2020, uh, where a student that I was working with kind of wanted to look at sepsis and what is going on with sepsis and how do we use uh, how, how do we use predictive analytics? Everyone, like all of these really cool algorithms, can we apply it? Sepsis is a complicated thing. And we looked at what had been published in the area and through this systematic review kind of narrowed it down and found basically 40% uh, of the papers published in sepsis were based on one data set that had been, um, that had been made shareable, the MIMIC data set out of Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston where people could kind of download it. And so you've got people who didn't, otherwise wouldn't have access to healthcare data were able to do this analysis. So imagine you take a data set, you release it to the public, and you increase the research productivity in that area by 40%. Kind of phenomenal, right? And yet we only have one really common instance of this. We really don't do a good job of sharing data. And so this is kind of the impetus for this. How can we do this? Well, you got to protect the patient privacy. That's first and foremost. We can't, like, we can't say, oh, great, we need to share data. Everyone's records are out there, and pretty soon you're looking at my chlamydia tests without my uh, really being appreciative of that. So, so synthetic data is this option where you can kind of take the data and adjust it so it analytically looks the same, but you, there's no real person there that you can talk about. And, and the two questions that people really come up with when we talk about synthetic data and are probably going through your mind, it was, okay, first of all, does that work? And second of all, how do you use it? And so what I've been doing over the last few years is studying that first question to a degree because that's the most important one to get to the second one. Does it really work? And the questions are like, well, you, does it work that it, you get the same results? Can you analyze the data in the same way? And number two, does it work where it protects patient privacy? And so we've done six studies about the functions and five studies about privacy. And I'm gonna kind of go through these in some pretty quick detail for a couple of reasons. Number one, because Mary Saltz has made it very clear that I need to finish on time. And number two, because it's gonna kind of get down in the weeds and I, I've been doing this for a while, so it's really exciting to me, but I have kind of seen that maybe it's not as exciting to other people as I talk about this, and so hopefully I can get through it. But at the end of this, what you wanna see here is like, Oh, it works, it works better than 
Um, it works just as well as regular things and it works better than other approaches and we can actually study things differently if we can share data. And then um, we, when we did the privacy validations, it does, like if, if your data were used to create that, you can't see you in there, you can't identify you, um, and even if you could, that doesn't mean that they, like, because we've messed everything up, that doesn't mean because the person that looks like you uh, has a chlamydia test result that that's the same as your chlamydia. So you really can't make inferences about people from it. So those, those are the main things, and now I'm gonna kind of walk through these because I've, you know, this is a little bit of passion for me. So, um, so the first thing was that we did with a study at uh, part of the N3C data, because this was this large collection of data, is tried to see, can we use it analytically? And, the, and as you're all familiar with what we were watching with COVID is can we take these data and do like, the, do the populations look the same? So in synthetic data and the regular data set, the populations basically look the same, synthetic on the right, regular on the left. Um, in terms of the diseases, they basically look the same, so the general, uh, the general characteristics. And then analytically, if we wanted to look at it, do they look, the, so epi curves, we now all know what epi curves are, we've been tracking it for a while, they told us whether we could go out for, to play or not for two years. Um, and so the blue is the original data and the red is the synthetic data and you know the counts and then the lines there and hopefully you can see that there's not a lot of difference between those. Now this is really important because the only other way, that the standard way to de-identify healthcare data is to do uh, what's called HIPAA, HIPAA safe harbor, HIPAA safe harbor de-identification where you have to remove the dates or you do some shifting of the dates. You can't draw epi curves with safe harbor de-identified data because you've either shifted the data or you, you don't have the comparative dates for it. So this is the only way you could do it and it actually worked really, really well for that. Um, and then we looked at it and said, well, can you uh, do it at like, down, another problem with the HIPAA de-identified data is you can't use zip codes even. You can't use geographic groups smaller than, smaller than three, um, the first three digits of a zip code, which for the city of Seattle means there's two groups. Uh, which is really like not useful for like, I, I, early in the pandemic we were looking, looking at heat maps where we could get it down to really tight geography. Is it, uh, I mean, honestly, once winter of 2020 hit and it was all over the place, like the benefit of what we were doing with N3C and the benefit of looking at heat maps and stuff was pretty much gone. It was like, okay, do you have COVID or not? And you're gonna get it. Because um, everyone was getting it at that time. So, but at the time when we were looking at this, um, the heat maps were important, but you, you like in the geographic area it became important looking at that. So uh, we looked at like getting down to the zip code and with tests and cases, admissions and all of these things that we were tracking, they still like we could still draw these epi curves and we could still actually do predictions for it um, in terms of the caseloads or in terms of the outcomes, whether they're going to the hospital and where they're going to be and how long they were going to be there. And then then a fascinating thing happened. So I was at the University of Washington and we were about to implement an EHR. Now, I've talked about that statement from Governor Burgum and the EHR implementations and all of that stuff and kind of the mess that we're in right now. The best part about where we are right now is that we don't have in the next five years a plan to rip and replace our EHR. That is the best thing going on for us right now. Um, the five years I was at the University of Washington, that's what they were dealing with the whole time. And that's amazing what that slows down and what you can do and everything like that. And so we were about to implement this and it was looking like it was gonna be right at a peak of COVID. And so in 20, early 2021, and you really don't do that because everyone's all frustrated anyway and the, the healthcare system was exhausted. Um, and so we were looking at that and so I asked the question and, and so what we did is we delayed our implementation by two months for our EHR at a cost of $10 million. So it costs you a million dollars a week for when you want to delay an EHR implementation. One million dollars a week. Which means that if you're a part of that team, you don't get to say, um, I think we need to slow down over here. Oh, is, are you gonna pay the million? Like that's a hard decision to make, which is why we're kind of somewhat in the mess we're in. But we looked at that, and as it turns out in the University of Washington, when we made that decision, we, we thought we were gonna be hitting a peak. We actually happened to make that decision right at a peak, and we could have saved that $10 million if we had just known. Well, how do you know those things? Well, it would have been nice if we could have taken the data from other states that were seen that wave go through, 
and to get an idea of the peak. And so we did this study of like using the previous data, can you actually predict the peak? And could we have used the data from another site to then apply to our own to have predicted the peak? And so we did that with looking at data from Massachusetts and North Carolina. And the important thing about this is this like, if you shared the data, would it make a difference? That's again, hard to do unless you're doing synthetic data. And we did this with synthetic data, and not only in the cases where there was a peak could we see it, but where there wasn't a peak we couldn't. Both things are important. And if we had done that, we would have made a difference. Now, this is not me. Um, this is uh, Tom Cruise playing uh, an amazing person in Mission Impossible. Um, which, and I do that because the privacy validation is like that. So what we tried to do there is, okay, so it works. It works, we could do things differently with synthetic data, this could be amazing, but does it protect privacy? And how do you really tell? Well, they don't look the same, and we did those studies, but really what we had to do is pretend that we were trying to break into the system. So we. So we tried to see is if, the, if we took a population that was created from synthetic data, can we gather information that's available publicly from voting records or other things, uh, public sources, and try and see is this person in this uh, data set? And we actually paid people to go through and be these, um, it's adversarial attack basically is what we're doing. So we paid people to look at it and figure out can you figure who that is? And so we looked at this and this is the, like they went through the actual matches where they said this person is in this data were relatively rare. Um, and then they had a confidence, like how sure are you that this person's in there? And so basically what we found is that with the synthetic data, not only was it less likely that they could make an assertion that someone's in there, most of the time they were wrong and it had nothing to do with how confident they were about it. Okay, so the chance of you being able to confidently identify someone in a population when it was synthetic data is basically none. Like, you, is it, it, could you do it by chance? Yes, but if it's a 2% chance, you have no confidence that that's you or that you can, be, that you can make assertions about it. And then we did some others, uh, then we automated that, didn't just do it with people, did it an automated method. And then, um, and then we started looking at, well, can you bring data together? Because we all kind of have this dream of, like, what if we gathered the healthcare data and the social services information, the data from all of these other sources and the cancer registries and link them together, and what could we learn from all of these joined data sources that would be really kind of fascinating? Um, the problem with that is that data have a fingerprint. And if we try and join data together, and I've got one set and access to that, and now I've joined it, and then you're releasing that publicly, I can tell who that person is just by a simple fingerprint, even if you've done full HIPAA de-identification, full safe harbor, because a single, like this was a study we did at Columbia where we looked at the results of individual lab tests. Like they had 300,000 Chem 7 tests, uh, which is seven measures, classic, uh, most people get it. Um, when you go to the hospital, classic measure, and there are these new numbers, and it like, what's the chance of these numbers that everyone ha that someone has the exact same number? Well, we looked at that, and in one year of 300,000, there were six of them that were the same as someone else. So there's basically a unique fingerprint, just one single lab test. So all I would, and, and that's one dimension. So just the, the number of days between three visits also becomes a very useful fingerprint and stuff. So data carry a fingerprint and you've got to, and so if you're merging data, you can always tell from the original source who the real person is in this stuff. And, and that's a problem if you're gonna merge data sets is that I, you're no longer hiding the data from me if, if, it's, a, um, if it's publicly available because I can figure out who that was. And if one of the sources that you're doing is related to sensitive data, that becomes a big problem. And since it's healthcare, it's all sensitive. Uh, think of a cancer registry um, and the information about that and if anyone got that information and misused it, the problem that that would do to what we can do with data in healthcare. So we tried to look at this and we kind of did, and so this is kind of, the, the fascinating thing is we did this synthetic versus real data and compared it and can you look at the fingerprints and so the lower right hand side, that's a straight up thing which means yes, they all have a fingerprint and then when we skewed it like, no, you couldn't tell and the people that you thought it was were like five people away. And so it's not matching identically to the people and so yes, synthetic data can skew it just enough. And then we finally looked at this like, well, what if you could see the right person and that test of, and if you have my a, uh, HIV results, uh, so does it really give you anything? And so HIV is rare enough that we were looking at something like depression, like what's the chance that the, if you think it's really me, or th what's the chance that the person that looks like me, exactly like me, has the same result for their depression score? And so we looked at that, and basically what we found is that but generally no, unless it's like a really rare person. So the, um, the person with the, that's 
six foot nine and 20 pounds. I mean, obviously no one's that, but like these extreme cases uh, where, where they don't look like anybody else and they just kind of stick out like a sore, sore thumb. In those cases, you can kind of have a little more confidence above 50% of something that, oh, this is probably them. But those things, you can actually censor that data out. So you can't, so it was actually useful that we saw that it didn't protect it fully, but that we had a solution around that. So that's synthetic data. Does it work? Does it work analytically? Yes. Does it work in terms of protecting people? Yes. So now what do we do with it? How can we share that? And that becomes a good opportunity for what we can do. Like, can we create these publicly available data sets? I mentioned Mimic and the impact that that has had on the field and what we can do and bring people out from it. Because again, we need more than just the people who have, are within healthcare systems to be able to teach us how to analyze healthcare data. Um, linking data across different sites and the richness that we could provide in that is also gonna be useful. And then data sharing. And finally, as we're learning things, it might be useful to validate. It worked here at Stony Brook. Does that mean we, can, we should disseminate this rule to everyone? And Epic, the electronic health record vendor got in trouble with this because they implemented this sepsis algorithm that they thought worked everywhere, and it turns out it doesn't. But it would have been nice if they could have shared data. Well, actually, they had the data. Um, if, they, if they could have validated at other institutions. Okay, so finally, how do we understand this? And I'm going to, again, go through a kind of interesting study. This uh, and kind of what we, and, and w the end of this is like, Hopefully you'll take out of this, okay, so it's not just the computer, we need people to actually think about this and how we think about using data, and that's an important thing. And so when you're attending something like a boot camp like you are today, a big challenge is learning about how you think about using healthcare data and kind of linking it together. So this relates to a study that I was asked to participate in at the University of Washington with um, heart transplants and left ventricular assist devices. So you've got people that are really sick and they're uh, left, their heart's not working correctly, and so you need to give them a device that helps them, and sometimes this is a bridge to transplant and sometimes this is a long-term therapy. So you're putting this device into someone, <clears throat> some more Kaplan-Meier curves, but the main thing here is like th this is, uh, this isn't actually um, a therapy, well, it's kind of therapy differences, but the, the main point of those is bad outcomes. So in five years, half of the people that um, get these, these things end up dying, and mainly it's because they're just really sick to begin with. This is kind of a last resort that we're doing to these people, and why do, the, why do they die? Well, because you're putting a device in someone, and you're breaking up blood cells, and you're causing reactions, and you're causing clots, and so that causes things like stroke, and the cause of death, the number one cause of death for the people in this population of this study was death. And then out of the top three, or three of the top five um, adverse outcomes are related to, you know, stroke also there. Or if you're trying to avoid stroke, you give them uh, blood thinners like Coumadin and so that they, can, they don't clot. And then if you do too much of that, then they have internal bleeding. So you're kind of balancing this. This is a big challenge that you're doing. So, the um, heart transplant group at University of Washington happened to have had um, eight bad outcomes in a row. Now, these bad outcomes are not completely uncommon, but whenever you have something eight in a row, even if it's a 50% chance, what's the, like flipping a coin eight times in a row, landing on heads each time, it's one out of 256. You kind of say, something's wrong here, we gotta look at this. And so they'd looked at it, and they came up with, and they were looking at it with this idea that maybe they're tracking the wrong measure for what is predicting bleeding. So one, the standard one is the time it takes to clot, which is partial thromboplastin time, or PTT, and another measure that's a little more advanced that they were looking at but not using as their decision uh, was uh, heparin anti-XA, or factor 10A, I'll refer to it as anti-XA and factor 10A, which is this measure of heparin and how it's inhibiting clotting. Both of these measures kind of indicate that, that they're tracking, and they said, I think we're looking at the long, wrong thing. We're looking at PTT, and maybe we should have been looking at factor 10A as we did this, and so we looked at 6,000 instances of what this is going. The first thing we did is correlate these together, and you'd hope that where one, where factor 10A was saying it was low risk, low risk, it would, both of them would be low risk and high risk the same, so you'd get this along the, I'm wondering, is this a, no, it's not. I was trying to think, is this a pointer, but I should have looked there, but that's dangerous. Um, so, so what you're seeing is that 47% over on the right side, that's like, that, what's that coming from? And when we looked at the actual points, that's what that looks like. So there's a bias in there where when PTT is high, factor 10A is still um, medium range. And we looked at that. So PTT has this therapeutic range between 30 and 70. Um, the reason that little spike is at 200 is because data sometimes comes across and it's like greater than 200. 
And we have to put that somewhere so everything's 201. That's the reason for the spike. For factor 10a, it's biased a little low, therapeutic range 0 0.3 to 0.7, and the below some point, it's just everything goes there for that, that tail there. And then we, um, <clears throat> we tried to look at, well, what's the bleeding risk? So the distributions didn't show much. They just showed a bias high versus low. In terms of bleeding risk versus not, didn't see much there, didn't see much between the two that we could really kind of tease out. And these are kind of standard statistical things that you would do to look at this. We actually did a little regression line between them, and we did notice a difference, but no one's changing healthcare based on that chart. <laughs> like, you go to someone, hey, we think we should change based on this. Like, no, no, you get out of here. That, that, that is just a mess. And so we, th we even did ROC curves and stuff, and we really weren't seeing this. And finally, we tried to represent this exactly as the clinical decision being made, which is, what is, how does the risk change when you use this point as a threshold value? Because ultimately, in medicine, what they're doing is a lot of threshold values. They, is it above this, and you choose one thing or not, a blow? And so we kind of modeled it this way, and this was the separation that we got between uh, factor 10A and PTT, where basically PTT was really non-discriminating there, and factor 10A was completely discriminating for the issues of actual bleeding. So we took this chart, and this is actually what changed healthcare at the University of Washington, where they moved from uh, PTT to factor 10A because they could see where it mattered most was these cases where they could look at it. And so this is kind of a fascinating story. But that's not the real lesson here. The real lesson is all of that analysis that I just showed you only served to reinforce what the doctors figured out looking at eight patients in a row. And why did that happen? So I talked about coin flips and flipping eight coins in a row and like the probability of that happening. As it turns out, it wasn't just starting from scratch and flipping eight coins in a row. It was like, what's the probability of a run of eight when you're flipping it 200 times? Because that's really what they experienced. It wasn't the first time they treated this, they got eight bad outcomes in a row. It was they'd been going along for a while and suddenly they get a run of eight. And in the 1700s, about the time that the native tribes were being pushed out of Long Island. Um, the, someone mathematically defined this, and they wrote that equation up there, and, I did, and you can go online and find where that's calculated, and it ends up being 32%. I didn't bother with the calculation. I actually modeled it with a computer algorithm, and basically showing it's about 32%. So what happens in healthcare is we have these events that we think are rare, which cause people to step back and look at it, and then they figure something out. And the tragedy is, is that we could have looked at that a long time ago if we could have just put all of them in a row together where you could have kind of seen the things. And so if we had done a subpopulation analysis of bad, bad outcomes together, we could have seen it. But it took them happening in a row to get everyone to stop and say something's wrong here, where we could have done it after 50 and looked at, let, let's look at the negative outcomes and see kind of what happened there and really kind of define that. Because it, it was very clear, like, people are really good at seeing patterns, really bad at uh, interpreting trends. Like something happens or like, oh, it's, it's, you know, and we can see it with stock market and stuff like that. Oh, like it went up today, it's going up, it's not stopping. Uh, that's why people buy high. <laughs> you know, that's why we get in trouble. Uh, it's not stopping, it's going up like that. And then, but those are statistical, usually those are statistical variations and machines do really good at that stuff, but they're really not so great at identifying patterns and stuff. So that's what, like, in terms of using data, figuring out how to make it accessible so that people can use it in the way that mentally we're best able to do that. Um, and it's important that we do this correctly because uh, we all have heard the stories about what happens when we use the data incorrectly in this al algorithm from Optum where they used this based on the existing data and applied it and all it did was um, exacerbate the existing uh, biases that we have in terms of race and class and healthcare. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna finish with what about ChatGPT because everyone wants to know about that. I would think of ChatGPT, now I started my career doing natural language processing and machine learning back in, you know, finished in 2000. Boy, did I miss out, right? Like think of how cool that would have been if I did it. Actually, no, because basically in healthcare, we were just using healthcare data to do this, so we were gathering. And along from the side comes people using all of this data, they're farming, and what, they, what ChatGPT, this one algorithm, is able to do in healthcare natural language processing kind of blows away 30 years of research in the healthcare space. So it's a really significant moment in terms of that. And it's also significant because it makes it accessible. Like we all can see it like, this is really cool. Is it going to change your life? Um, 
in some ways a little bit, but it's not as big of a deal as people are hyping, but it is a really big thing in terms of some things it's done because of the leveraging of data that it's done. They've looked at it and said, wow, look, it just like does all of these things. It, it, it's like a doctor with the time to read everything, <laughs> or almost like, but you know, because there's so much information. But then other people are like, well, what do we do with this? What do we do with this, you know, this AI? And what's really going to happen? Is it taking our jobs away and stuff like that? And for that, I'm going to use uh, a final analogy that I want to try. These are my two favorite images from the 1800s. Uh, one because of the subject and the other because of the, um, the style. So when we think of Abraham Lincoln, he's probably one of the first presidents that we think about more in terms of the photograph than the painting. <clears throat> Up until this point, you know, John Adams, uh, Andrew Jackson, everyone we think of the presidential portrait is the painting. And with Abraham Lincoln, I don't even know what the presidential portrait painting looks like, but we know the photographs really well because the, uh, the dagger type and the lithographs, and by the time of the, of the Civil War, the photograph had been, like it wasn't perfected like now. You can see it's black and white and they had to sit there for a long time and stuff like that, but it, it could capture what was there. The painting on the right, Van Gogh's Starry Night, was painted 30 years later. The, the one on the left was three months before Lincoln was assassinated. So in the 1890s, um, Van Gogh painted Starry Night, which sto like, stops being such a realistic representation. Now, I raised my kids, I've got four kids, raised them in New York City a lot, and I would take them to, like, to get them out of the apartment, we would go to the Met often, and I'd walk them through and trying to explain to them what they were seeing as we went through this art. And so here's the classical period, and these are, you know, the art here is funded by very wealthy people, and so it's like magnificent and grandeur and echoes of the past, and you're like a Greek god, and that's what they're painting. And then over time, with the influence of the American and French revolutions, suddenly the common man becomes important, why we've got these still lives of the farming, and some of the kind of the nat national, um, the national uh, kind of... Um, nationalism that lead to these broad landscapes that people are painting, so kind of the things undergoing. But I would love to take them to the modern art because I, I would say to them, by now, photographs are available. It stops being about, can we represent this? Can we, can we paint something that represents visually what we saw? It starts being about, what can we do that's more than what we just saw? And the Impressionists are one of my favorite periods of art, and they happened after the photograph, because it wasn't any more about can you just represent this, they had photographs for that. It was about can you represent something more than visual, can you represent something about impressions, or emotions, or movement, or three dimensions in terms of cubism, and stuff like that. So when I think of ChatGPT, I oftentimes think in terms of there's something deeper here that we get to explore with it, because it's one thing to be able to produce words, and sentences and language, and it's another thing to actually be able to produce meaning. And so what I'm looking forward to, that all of you hopefully get to participate in, is this world in which, in the same way that art transitioned, once we, could, once we no longer had to paint for representing visually something deeper. With ChatGPT and something that can produce words, it's not about just can you write the paper, it's about the substance of what you're actually saying. And I think that that will be really powerful in terms of what it can separate out there as we go. And so I started with um, farming, and I am finishing with art. <laughs> and I'm tying this, like, I wanted to get this because, like, you know, the topic is real world data and what we do. And this kind of looks like real world. And I'm coming from the Midwest and stuff. but. Um, you know, the, the future is bright in this area and what we can kind of do with this information, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share data. I'm looking forward that now we've had this huge disruption of electronic health records and they're installed, that we don't have that disruption again. The, you know, we went from, uh, you know, the goal was implementation because I talked about the costs. And then we do optimization because we can't deal with it because it's painful. But that was never the goal. The goal was transformation. And so we need people who kind of understand like what we were doing at Intermountain Healthcare at the time and how to actually transform care effectively with that. And we need people thinking that can think well. We need people that can figure out how to share the data broadly and as many people as possible as that can access this because we need as many minds and great minds to doing it. Otherwise, we're going to get pushed away from the side, much in the same way that natural language processing and healthcare is being pushed from ChatGPT. And finally, we need people who can kind of really think about um, 
what we, how we actually analyze this and how to make it more accessible to people. Thank you so much for your time. So the question is, can you explain about synthetic data and what's, what's kind of a difference, different about it? So you take a data set from the real data and you apply an algorithm that, that goes and adjusts the values. So it goes and adjusts the values of a population, kind of skews it around. So imagine you're mashing it together. You're taking all this data, mashing it together, pulling it out, and saying, does it look the same? Is, it, like, is anyone the same there? And does it look the same uh, in terms of statistically about the thing? And then can we analyze it? And so, that calculate that involves a lot of calculations to do it correctly, and I think there's many ways of doing it. One, you could just randomly mess it up, and then and then you've got a thousand different ways it could be messed up, and one of them it looks correct, and maybe you'll take that. Or the other one is that you're kind of using statistical variation on it uh, in different ways to kind of mess it up. And so you've now got this data, and it looks like instead of um, Adam Wilcox, that someone called. Uh, Aaron Wilson that might look like him and, and instead of being 52 years old it's 48 but has some of the clinical conditions and some of them not but that's okay because someone else who may be um, David Smith who is also kind of mixed in with there and so it kind of looks similar analytically at an individual le level there is no one that looks the same but enough people look the similar in terms of small subpopulations that you can analyze it as, uh, as if it were real data. Now, the question that people always ask about synthetic data is like, well, what do you do if you get a result? Like, you don't know if that's real. Maybe it just works on that synthetic data set. And that's true. Maybe it just does. Maybe it just works on Aaron Wilson and David Smith and not the real people. But you, that's the place to play around and find something interesting, and then you can validate that interesting thing by going to, we, f we think we found this, which is an interesting finding, can we run it on the real data? Which then makes it accessible, that partnership. But the import And they've kind of done this a lot with the de-identified data set that they have with Mimic with sepsis, because that's from one institution, and it's de-identified, and so unless, like, unless you're in Boston, Maybe the Boston people have sepsis a little, I mean, kind of, but, not, but the, the healthcare system is a little slightly different. So we did this at Boston, now how does it work within our institution? That's kind of what they do. And in many ways, synthetics the same way, but it's a way to make these data sets more accessible that way. But the most important part about it is, um, we have to make it so you can't figure out whose data that are, you can't, those are. You can't go in there and say, oh, you know, I was looking at this, publicly released data set and it looks really a lot like you. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking I'm learning some things about you. And so, you know, just imagine that. So the best way is imagine that conversation someone's making. I remember doing this early in COVID. Like if I had had COVID in my neighborhood and they had released this publicly accessible data set to analyze it, and it also had, you know, some more sensitive information, could my neighbors knowing my general height and general weight and that they were there for a birthday party <laughs> uh, a little while ago, could they have figured out, and that they heard that I got COVID, could they have figured out you know, some sensitive information from that if it was leaked out? And so the benefit of synthetic data is like, I think I see someone who looks like you, and you can say, yeah, it kind of looks like me, but pro chances are it doesn't really, and if you think that there's anything you can draw from it, then chances are no. So that's, the, I, I like to think of it in terms of imagining that conversation of someone saying, is, is this, isn't this your data? I found it in this synthetic data. And you can say, you know, it may look like me in these terms, but it, that doesn't mean it has any, uh, you know, statistically, uh, you have no confidence that you can say anything else about me for that. Okay. You're, What can't you do with synthetic data? Um, so the cases where we found that it didn't work, um, and that was the Thomas paper that was published in uh, Jamia, was when you have a low level, so we were looking at all of the zip codes, and, um, and as we looked at zip codes that were more rural and we had fewer people, we suddenly couldn't, like, they would censor the data because one of the, the challenges is if there's not enough people that look like you, the, in order to protect the privacy, they remove those people from the data set. And so the analytic capability where there were lower populations was no longer good enough. And so that's one of the things, you can't do it with small, set, small data sets, first of all. 
Um, the other thing is, I, and I kind of alluded to this in the answer to the last question, is you, can't, you don't have confidence that what you picked up from the set synthetic data is actually real. It's what you saw with the synthetic data. Now, I think you've got you know, pretty good idea that what you see within that data set is probably going to be true within the real one. But um, in the same sense that no one is going to change healthcare based on those regression lines that were kind of looking like a jumble mess, if you went to someone and said, hey, we use this synthetic data set and you need to be doing these things differently, that may be true, but no one's going to like change it until they've actually implemented or demonstrated that it's true on their own data. And so you, the, it does require that step. I don't think that's a problem for it because that's not the challenge we're facing with. The challenge we're facing with is we don't have enough people analyzing the data to begin with. And so a similar question would be, what can you do with ChatGPT? You can do a really good first draft, but writing the final with ChatGPT, like, there's these great stories of people posting of like, you know, online when people are writing tests. It's like, this was easy to grade because they just copied the chat GPT answer without putting, you know, and copied it when it said, chat GPT cannot give an answer to this question, you know. <laughs> so that's a good example of what you can't do there. Other questions? I, I have a question. Okay. Um, I would like to ask you, why does Intermountain Health do better than everywhere else? Oh, that's a great, great question. So, um, uh, it's, I want to say it's because I was there, and I don't <laughs> think that's the case. Um, so Intermountain Healthcare was an integrated delivery network. So they had an insur so they were an in insurer, and they uh, employed physicians, they owned the hospitals. And that alignment of incentives is really, really important. So because if they were able to figure out a way to save data, there were probably, like, why were we working on data on diabetes? Because the health plan said, this is actually a big problem. We, like, there's an opportunity to save money here, we, and so they can contribute money into it. And that alignment, you kind of see in Kaiser and other large organizations like that that are doing similar things. So an integrated delivery network has good strength there. Now, that is not the world in which we are right now. And as we can kind of see, I can opine on like where are we going with healthcare as a whole and what are we looking for? And this is actually a pretty good argument for why you want to learn how to use world, real world data. Because those of us that have been watching what's going on in healthcare, it feels like, it feels like this really big consolidation of two armies. On one side is the payers, and there's really not many payers anymore. They're all kind of consolidating, and they've got their data. And on the other side is the providers, and there's like lots of mergers of healthcare systems, and they're they're consolidating, and they've got their data, and they're all, both going to end up with this big fight over data. You know who's right, and you know we've got we've got uh, across the whole spectrum, we've got the breadth. That's what the claims data are going to say, and then well, we've got the depth. That doesn't doesn't really represent what's really going on because we've got it deeper, and you know my patients are sicker, uh, and things like that that they're going to say. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we don't go to war. I'm hoping that somewhere along the lines, and the CMMI grants were supposed to kind of do this, but I think they, in the environment, kind of failed a little bit while we were still getting used to um, the results of Obamacare. I'm hoping that some places you're going to have payers and providers that are going to say, you know, I think we're both going to do better if we can find a way to collaborate on this, and let's figure out a collaboration and work through this and where we can align incentives together. Because if they can do that, you can do similar things. Like, it's all about are the incentives aligned. Healthcare is a tragic story of perverse incentives. And Intermountain, they weren't as perverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, uh, thank you. My, uh, I was in private practice radiology for a long time. And you get paid by the procedure. And if there's a complication and you fix it, you get paid for that too. So. The uh, chief of our group always said, well, you know, some people think it's bad when you give someone a pneumothorax during a lung biopsy. He said, but we get paid more for it. <laughs> and he was joking, but actually it was true. I mean, we did get paid more for it, and that's not a good incentive. Right. And, and everyone knows they're there, because like a doctor can joke about this is, he's not saying, you know, more pneumothorax as he's saying, we got to fix these incentives. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he was a, a, a wonderful man, but the incentive was just absolutely right. crazy. Now, what about the homogeneity of the population? Yeah, that's well? a good question. That's a really good question. Um, so uh, I used to ask the question, like, what if, what if someone changed healthcare? And you see kind of some interesting things done in Vermont, right? 
like where they're really doing some interesting impacts in Vermont. And it's a lot like Utah in that sense. Uh, there were some innovations. And then you say, well, does anyone really care? I mean, it's not that you don't care about Vermont, but it's like that doesn't represent the rest of the country. The real challenge is to do it where, where there's a lot of heterogeneity and stuff. And so we're going to need examples beyond just uh, Intermountain Healthcare, which can show what's possible if everything lines up to help other, like, because they showed you can actually, if you do it right, get diabetes to that level, right? But that doesn't mean everyone like, okay, so, but there's some other issues that make it easier for you and something like that in the population. And I worked on healthcare in New York City and Salt Lake City. And I'll tell you, there's, I don't think one place transla translates directly to the other place. Like the, there's, there's differences in, in the systems and the, the, how people move and the state borders and all of that. Um, so it does have some homogeneity of the population, but the, that's like those demonstrations in populations like that are still useful for what's possible because it showed what's possible with diabetes. Just because it was easy doesn't mean the results weren't useful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? In the back. Hi. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, so I have a question about going back to the synthetic data. Um, how, when you're changing it to make it synthetic, is there a step to make sure or how do you determine the medical plausibility of that particular case? Yeah, so that's a, so that's a good question. Um, so first of all, I'm not the expert in that. We use a software, a commercial software, MD clone, that they do it. And, there, and there's two different ways to do synthetic data. One way that we imagine is where you take the whole healthcare record and instead of the example I gave, instead of Adam Wilcox, you've got Aaron Wilson, where it all just skewed a little bit differently. And that's actually not the way MD clone works. It's like, okay, there's a question that you want to answer, so you build your analytic data set, and then we create a synthetic data, data set from that table, which is a little easier to do in terms of making it analytically correct and stuff. And so when I, when I, oftentimes when I describe it that way, people are like, oh, yeah, that's a little easier. Uh, because like Cynthia and other ones that try and create that record, they're, they're kind of doing it more general, and, and I don't know that we've validated its capability to do things analytically, but when, when it's a more constrained study, like the benefit of MD-Clone is like it's, it's a little easier. It doesn't do it fully, but we can create multiple sets to do the analytic thing. And so as I describe, I see you nodding, as I describe it, that it's as if you've got just a few tables and you're kind of doing it, it makes, makes it more possible mentally to kind of imagine how it does it. Um, some try and do it like Cynthia is, is a freely available one, but uh, we haven't validated. I, I can't say whether it works the same way of, of these validations that we've done on MD clone. Um, but it just kind of skews things around. I mean, when we did that study on fingerprinting, we were like, well, you know, let's, let's bin these things. Let's take away the first digit. <laughs> you know, they're three digits long for the, for the potassium levels or something like that. Let's, let's round up or something like that. Or you start with binning and then do what they find. There's still pretty good fingerprints with that until you get to down to five, five bins, which is like very low, low, medium, you know, moderate, high, very high, and stuff like that, which is almost useless. Um, I guess it's still useful in a little bit. By then, you, you start to see more, more coll collisions of those cases, and so and so it's not as the fingerprints are not as obvious at that point. But that's a lot of work to do it. Um, with synthetic, you're just kind of you're you're munching the fingerprints around enough. Do we have time for one yeah, more? We have one more. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your presentation. I guess also maybe it's just like my lack of understanding, but how do you make sure that the synthetic like data is still accurate? Because when analyzing data sets, like aren't those like exact values? I don't know. Yeah. Kind of important. So, um, so the question, how do you make sure it's, uh, it's still accurate? Um, we think it is, first of all. We can always test whether it was because we can go back to the real data set. Like suppose you've got, you know, you, you spend two months analyzing the synthetic data and you've got something that's really interesting that you think you found. It's really easy to just, okay, does that work on the real one and submit that and then we can test it without releasing the data. We think this is a pattern, can you release it? 
we can analyze. So it allows us to provide access to the synthetic data for analysis and then test it against the real thing. Did you, what you found in synthetic data, is it also a, true in the real data? So that's the best way to do it. But what makes it really work is the problem that we're facing is that all of those people analyzing data out there that could be analyzing healthcare data just don't have anything that looks like healthcare data to begin with. And so the synthetic data, the real asset to it, isn't that it gets you all the way to the end. You know, we can get the real data for that part. It's that we, by spreading out the access to data, we can have a lot more studies with it. Does that answer your question? Like the best, so the, the short answer is, well, you don't until you actually apply it to the real data, but applying it to real data answers your question, did it work? And I expect that there's going to be errors, but not many. When we did that, it was like one out of 20. So 19 out of tw times out of 20, what we found with the synthetic data in terms of an an analysis was the same. Once, occasionally, it's like, oh, that's just an aberration of the synthetic data. So that's why you do need to do that final test. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for, you. for the invitation.